Uh, great to see you all. Uh, welcome again to those of you who are on live stream with us this morning. We're uh, glad to be connected. Uh, glad you're with us this morning in person. If this is your first time, we're glad you're here. Uh, Juan, was that your first time on the platform playing the congas? Where's Juan? Somewhere around here. Was that, was that your first time on the platform playing? Thanks for bringing your gifts of percussion. That's awesome. Uh, greetings to those of you who are way there in the back there. Just a reminder again, the best seats are in the front. Uh, so if you ever want to move up, that'd be great. And then also just a note, I might go a little long this morning. If you need to squeeze out at 1030, you might want to move to the back now and switch places with those people to kind of make that a little bit more uh, discreet. Um, along with a bunch of other churches in the Bay Area, we're continuing this morning with a series called Explore God, during which we're looking at three not easy but very important questions that are asked uh, by both people outside the church, outside the Christian faith, outside of Christianity, uh, but also inside the church, uh, within the, the family of God. People who identify themselves as Christians and followers of Jesus also ask these questions. Uh, two Sunday mornings ago when we began, we uh, dealt with the question, does life have a purpose? Last week we talked about the question, is there a God? Uh, this morning we're going to look at the question, uh, why does God allow pain and suffering? Why does God allow pain and suffering? As Jeff kind of alluded to some as he led us in prayer. Before we jump into that, though, let me pray one more time. God, open us up to uh, yourself, your truth, your grace, uh, your spirit. Uh, Holy Spirit, speak to us, empower us, fill us. Move among us, guide us, and lead us. Uh, you, God, be our teacher. We ask that you would plant within us uh, your words that will bring life, uh, that will bring you glory, and that will bring your people joy. I pray and ask that as my words are true to your word, that they be taken to heart. If my words stray or deviate or are inconsistent in any way with your word, may they be quickly and forever forgotten. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So pain and suffering, pain and suffering come in lots of different forms, some of which some of us have known, uh, many of which have been experienced firsthand and very personally by people in the congregation here. For example, broken bones, nerve damage, brain injuries, chronic and debilitating illnesses, cancer, the unexpected and or premature death of close friends and loved ones and parents and spouses and even children. Trauma of various sorts, physical abuse, sexual abuse, mental illness, severed relationships, wrecked marriages, depression, addiction, and all of the collateral damage that often goes with addiction. Why does God allow pain and suffering? Beyond this congregation, I've known lots of people who have been the victims of various sorts of crimes, even murder a couple of people. Why does God allow pain and suffering? On a larger community scale, there are everyday auto accidents, there's gun violence, there is rape in our community, in our region, in our world, in our neighborhoods. Why does God allow pain and suffering? And there are natural disasters like the wildfires that struck Paradise, California, and Maui, and tsunamis like the one that on the day after Christmas in 2004 killed 225,000 people in North Sumatra and in Indonesia in one day. And so many other floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and droughts and earthquakes like the one that killed thousands last night in Afghanistan. Natural disasters that have devastated regions that have wrecked lives, that have taken lives. Why does God allow pain and suffering? Globally, there's famine often caused by human fighting and wars. There is famine and resulting starvation. There is trafficking of women and children. There is war like what's going on this morning in Ukraine and Israel and the Gaza Strip. 
There is genocide, political and cultural oppression, racism, injustice, apartheid, and in American history and many other histories, the evil of slavery. Why has God through the centuries and still today in our current history, why does God allow pain and suffering? And we could go on, I could go on, you could go on, we could make sort of list, list, list. There's a small number of people in history and in the world today who subscribe to different forms of what's called Gnosticism, a belief that's called Gnosticism, or to some Eastern religions, which deny or pretend that pain and suffering don't really exist. In other words, they would say that pain and suffering are figments of our imagination or illusions that we can sort of be done with by simply pushing them out of our minds. The vast majority of us, though, don't need to be persuaded that there's absolutely much real pain and suffering in the world and around us, all about us. We read about it, we see it, we hear about it, we experience it. The question before us this morning, though, and the question that eats away at some people's faith or at the possibility of faith in a God that they're not sure exists is why does God allow pain and suffering? And more specifically, why does a supposedly good and loving God allow pain and suffering in our lives and in the world, or if there is a God, if there's a God at all, and if this God is, as you say, good and all-powerful, why does this God allow pain and suffering to exist and even sometimes to flourish? It is this question, this kind of basket of questions that we're dealing with this morning. But first, let me say before I go too far along, understanding why God, whom all summer long we called love, Understanding why God, who is love, seems to allow pain and suffering is hard, especially if and one is in the middle of pain and suffering oneself, or when a loved one is going through a really hard time, or even when someone simply reads about the pain and suffering or witnesses it in others, even others that one doesn't know. This is a really, really hard question. And honestly, there's not a single perfectly satisfying answer or response to this question. There's not. In fact, there are a variety of ways this question might be answered, and not a single one of them is completely satisfying on its own. But altogether, they may at least help us to think about pain and suffering differently and or to think about God differently. And so with that caveat and or that hope, here we go. What is, why does God allow pain and suffering? I'm going to start with the fairly easy ones, elementary responses. First, the laws of nature. When God created all that God created, God embedded in his creation laws that would remain constant, which is good, and usually these constant laws of nature work in our favor, but not always. We like the law of gravity when we're out going for a run or when we're drinking a cup of coffee. Both would be more difficult without gravity as we know it, but when a person stumbles and falls drawn to the ground by gravity, those bumps and bruises and broken bones are a result of gravity. But God is not going to suspend the laws of nature or of gravity because you are clumsy or you are careless or someone left a banana peel on the proverbial road. You're just gonna have to deal with that. It's not God's fault. Similarly, if you drive your car really fast, too fast, around a corner at too high a speed, the law of centrifugal force may cause you to lose control of your car and crash, hit a pole, hit another car, and get really hurt, mess up your car, but you get really hurt because you and your car have failed within, to live within God's good laws of nature, which is not God's fault, but it's our own fault, the laws of nature. Secondness is the fallenness of humanity. From a biblical perspective, suffering is intrinsically related to the fall and the fallenness of this world. According to this understanding, there is no pain Prior to the fall of man, there was no suffering before Adam and Eve's disobedience, their rebellion, their sin. Rather, suffering entered the world as a part of God's right and appropriate judgment of the world. As the Reformed theologian R.C. Sproul describes this, a righteous judge, in other words, God, must allow a lawbreaker, criminal, or violent offender to be punished and to suffer. How could a just or upright or fair or good or righteous judge not allow punishment for those who have committed acts of violence or crime of any sort. 
A friend of mine has written, we are not as innocent as we think we are in the pain and suffering realm. Our choice to disobey and distrust God is an incalculable offense. However, on this point, and this is very important, in chapter nine of John's gospel, some Pharisees asked Jesus, trying to again sort of corner him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sins or the sins of his parents? And Jesus replied, neither one. Thus, you and I can't come to the conclusion that any individual's particular suffering in this world is directly related to or in direct proportion to that particular individual's sin or sins. This maximum is more general than that. The fact remains, however, that if there was no sin in the world, there would not be any suffering in the world. God allows suffering as part of God's righteous and appropriate judgment, but God also uses it for our redemption. Stay tuned, we'll talk about this in a minute. Next is free will. We were made in the image of God, sort of the biblical idea from the very beginning. We human beings, humanity, men and women, are made in the image of God, made by God in his image. And God possesses free will and thus each of us have a free will. God can choose to do what God wants to do and God does. And so also we who are made in God's image by his grace, have been granted the same freedom which we all love and for which we are all grateful. We want that freedom. What we don't want is all of the responsibility and accountability that goes with it, that goes with that freedom. God made us free and it is that freedom that allows us to love, to love God and to love others. If we were not free, we could not love. To love someone else requires freedom, otherwise we would be mere robots. But freedom can sometimes be dangerous, just look at America. It can get us into trouble and it can cause all manner of pain and suffering to those around us, to those close to us, to those in our communities, to our fellow inhabitants of earth. In his little book, The Problem of Pain, C.S. Lewis wrote these words. I I have tried to show in a previous chapter that the possibility of pain is inherent in the very existence of a world where souls can meet. It's inherent. When souls become wicked, they will certainly use this possibility to hurt one another, and this perhaps accounts for four-fifths of the suffering of men. It is men and women, not God, who have produced racks, whips, prisons, slavery, guns, bayonets, and bombs. It is by human avarice or human stupidity, not by the churlishness of nature, that we have poverty and overwork. A common estimate, a commonly estimated figure is that as much as 90% of the suffering in the world comes through human causes, through wars, genocide, human trafficking, murder, torture, racial discrimination, domestic abuse, sexual abuse, rape, etc. And God doesn't want any of this. God's not the author of any of this. God's not responsible for any of this. God gives us freedom, though. Why does God allow pain and suffering? Because God has granted to us, made in his image, the gift and the grace of freedom, the freedom of our wills. And again, we are not as innocent as we think. Our choice to disobey and distrust God is an incalculable offense. The next reason is, interestingly, to get our attention. It is possible that God allows pain and suffering in our lives in order to get our attention. Here again, C.S. Lewis in his little book, The Problem of Pain, writes, we can ignore pleasure. We can ignore pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. When everything is going peachy and status quo in one's life, which is what we mostly want, maybe it's harder to hear God. Maybe it's harder to for God to get one's attention when our lives are overflowing with goodness and blessing and abundance and privilege and prosperity and pleasure and distractions, maybe we don't hear as well. And then there is the matter of deepening a person's character in which God is immensely interested in the Apostle Paul's words in his letter to the Romans. We glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces hope. When I read this, I'm reminded of how committed we are as a culture, as a people, as a race to comfort and pleasure 
and sometimes even numbness. And we forget that there are more things that are more important than having all the toys that we want. From God's point of view, character is one of those. Similarly, God can use pain and suffering to reshape people as his sons or daughters. The author of the book of Hebrews wrote these words, our parents disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Oh. My mom's here this morning, and I remember one time she washed my mouth out with soap when I was about eight years old. One time, I thought she was the most wicked person on the face of the earth. However, did my language improve? Yes. Did I talk back to her ever again? No. Was what she did to me personally, hands-on, with a bar of soap, a painful act for her? Absolutely. Was it a means of discipline for me that was good? Absolutely. Our parents disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Good and loving parents sometimes allow children, their children, to experience disappointment and failure and pain and or even suffering if they believe that doing so will lead to a harvest of righteousness and peace in the longer run. As heartbreaking as that is for parents, to allow one's child to go through pain and suffering of various sorts, parents doing so can be a beneficial and even a essential part of a young person's growth and maturation. I was talking to a mother this week, she called the church and just completely baffled and unsure and stuck about what to do with a, a disobedient son. And just everything in her was leaning toward caving in to give him what he wanted so that he would know that he was loved. To give him sort of, to help him out, to bail him out, to bail him out, to ignore all the sort of disrespect and everything else. And as we talked to her, the obvious answer became no. Discipline, even for your son at this age, is gonna be infinitely better for him and for you and for your relationship in the long run. No doubt about it. Next, pain can also give a person more spiritual and eternal perspective on things. Again, from the Apostle Paul, this time from his second letter to the church in Corinth, Paul wrote, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Just this complete reorientation for Paul, despite his difficult outward physical circumstances. And I could go on, and I'm gonna go on, actually. But first I wanna say, sort of pause and say two things here. Not every reason why God allows pain and suffering applies to every circumstance, all right? So these, all of these things don't apply all to you or to a particular circumstance or some other situation. They are just possible reasons why, among many. Second, not knowing a good reason why God has allowed something doesn't mean that there is not a good reason. Think about that for just a moment. In the words of Tim Keller in his book, The Reason for God, just because you can't see or imagine a good reason why God might allow something to happen doesn't mean there can't be one. Again, we see lurking within supposedly hard-nosed skepticism an enormous faith, Keller writes, in one's own cognitive faculties. In other words, our thinking goes, if our minds can't plumb the depths of the universe for good answers to suffering, well, then there can't be any. And Keller says that this actually is blind faith of a higher order. If you have a, have a God great and transcendent enough, Keller writes, to be mad at because he hasn't stopped evil and suffering in the world, then you have at the same moment a God great and transcendent enough to have good reasons for allowing it to continue that you simply can't know. And indeed, we can't have it both ways, Keller finishes. And there are many 
other possible reasons why God may have allowed or continues to allow suffering in the world and in your life and my life and in the world, such as? Suffering can uncover what is really happening inside a person's heart, your heart, my heart. Suffering can uncover, remove the lid from what's really going on. Suffering can break a person's pride or said another way, suffering can bring about humility. Suffering can deepen a person's desire for God. You may have had that experience in your life. Suffering can move a person toward maturity. This is not to say that people who haven't suffered can't be mature or well along the road or have deep and profound experiences, they can. But people who have suffered, who have gone through immense pain, know something personally and in a way that the rest of us don't or maybe, maybe even can't. Suffering can jumpstart a person's prayer life. Suffering may lead a person to confess some sin. Suffering can teach a person firsthand that God truly is sufficient. Remember what Paul wrote a little bit later in his second letter to the Corinthians? He wrote, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Was it something that he was excited about? No, he calls it a thorn in his flesh. Was it painful? Probably. Did it involve suffering? Probably. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will, Paul, boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then in Christ, by God's grace, I am strong. How many of us could say that? Not me. I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties because they remind me of God's all-sufficient grace. Suffering can connect us with other people. Suffering can create opportunities for a person to share their faith. I was thinking about Dave Webb, yesterday who spent a good bit of the latter part of his life in the hospital and skilled nursing facilities and I visited him a number of times early in COVID when he was really suffering. And yet through Dave, all of these medical people, nurses, doctors, attendants, techs, entered a room just that just radiated the kingdom of God and love and joy through Dave. I will never forget that. Suffering can create opportunities for a person to share their faith, and Dave never missed an opportunity. Suffering can make a person grateful for what they once had or what they still have. Have you ever sort of gotten really sick and be like, oh man, I'm so grateful for all the times I'm not sick, for all of the good stuff in life as I'm experiencing this, this misery for a, a short time. Suffering when endured in a particular way, can bring glory to God. I thought yesterday about Nelson Mandela. What, 27 years in prison? And God was glorified even more with each passing year. And again, not every one of these reasons that God allows pain and suffering applies to every circumstance, but there's this principle that we read about in the scriptures that, can, that continually is evident in God's kingdom and with God, and that is that God can bring about good from bad, and sometimes or even often God does. Again, Paul wrote to the Romans this verse with which we're all familiar, chapter eight, verse 28. We know that in all things, in all things, all things, God works for good. For those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, in all things God is at work for the good of those who love him, even when it doesn't seem like such, even in the midst of pain and suffering, the God we know in Jesus and the scriptures in the Old Testament and Abraham and Exodus, Moses, the prophets, the kings, works for good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes in all things. The book of Genesis ends with Joseph, the Old Testament Joseph, declaring to his older brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
And sometimes that's just how God is and what God does, bringing about good out of pain and suffering and difficulty and hardship and injustice and persecution and even tragedy. I have a pastor friend who lost a young daughter to a terrible swimming pool accident many years ago. There was nothing good about that. Everything was awful, tragic, painful, excruciating, terrible. And yet within a short amount of time, as he began to tell the story without discounting or ignoring or stuffing the incredible pain of a parent who loses a child, began to see that he was empowered and equipped and called in a new way to minister to people who had lost children. And he was gifted by God through his experience for exactly that, God bringing good out of what was nothing but bad. Tim Keller wrote another example of, a, of this in, in one of his books. I'm going to read that in a second, but also want to recommend to you another book. Uh, I read it a long time ago. It's called A Severe Mercy by a guy named Sheldon Van Aken. And uh, anyone read this book? Oh, a couple. Wow, a few people. That's fantastic. Uh, if you haven't, uh, I recommend. Um, he tells the story, and the title of the book is A Severe Mercy, but he tells the story about he, not a follower of Jesus, not someone with faith in God, and not inclined to and not wanting to, but how through his marriage and through his wife's long, slow decline in illness and eventually her death, and through their relationship with C.S. Lewis, he uh, took this, this terrible but in the end wonderful journey that he would not have been on had his wife not gotten this terrible illness and eventually died. And it was her death that led to his coming to faith and the transformation of his life in every way, outwardly and inwardly. And so he called it, actually C.S. Lewis first called it, and then he called it a severe mercy, that through pain and suffering that no one would wish upon anyone else, his life was opened up in ways that it never could have been otherwise. Tim Keller writes, I knew a man in my first parish who had lost most of his eyesight after he was shot in the face during a drug deal gone bad. He told me that he had been an extremely selfish and cruel person, but he had always blamed his constant legal and relational problems on others. The loss of his sight had devastated him, but it had also profoundly humbled him. Quote, as my physical eyes were closed, my spiritual eyes were opened, as it were. I finally saw how I'd been treating people. I changed, and now for the first time in my life, I have friends, real friends. It was a terrible price to pay, and yet I must say it was worth it. I finally have what makes life worthwhile. And none of us should one ever get the impression that God is either a fan of pain or suffering or the author of pain and suffering. He is not. Rather, God is compassionate toward those who experience pain and suffering. One need look no further than the Son of God, Son of Man, Jesus, in his earthly life and his travels and his interactions constantly exhibiting compassion to those who were suffering in a variety of ways exhibiting how not just Jesus, but God the Father cared for people and met them in their pain and suffering. That was his life. And yet it can still be problematic for some people, many people, most people, that there remains inexplicable and intolerable pain and suffering in people's lives and in the world for which there seem to be no reason or justification or purpose. God may be compassionate, God may truly care, but pain and suffering are still pain and suffering. All the reasons for such above often do not actually change reality. It doesn't get God off of the hook, someone argues, and that is true. And in response, theologian and philosopher Peter Kreef has pointed out that the Christian God came to earth and came to us specifically and deliberately to put himself on the hook of human suffering and for human suffering. In Jesus Christ, God experienced the depths of pain and suffering. Therefore, though Christianity does not provide the reason for each experience of pain, of pain, it provides deep resources for actually facing suffering with hope and with courage rather than bitterness, despair, and hopelessness. 
God knows our suffering. He voluntarily took it on, experienced it, every temptation, every pain, every suffering that we could have, every ridicule, every ostracization, is that a word? Nails in his hands and a spear in his side. And yet there is more. If that was it, that wouldn't be enough. But there is more in the Christian story, and God enacts a plan through which he intends to fully vanquish pain and suffering from the world, from your community, from your household, and from your life in the end. And that was the message, that was part of the message of Jesus' resurrection. The story doesn't end, it never ends at the cross in pain and suffering, but it ends in the conquering of death and the overcoming of all pain and suffering. I'm going to finish with These two snippets from the penultimate and the ultimate, the last and next to last chapter of the book of Revelation. Hear the word of the Lord. John wrote, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will, no be, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The wars, the fighting, the abuse, the hate, the racism, the dementia, the Parkinson's, the ALS. Whatever it was that took our beloved Paul, and on and on and on. It's going away. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. Curse comes in chapter three of the book of Genesis, chapter 22 declares it will no longer be. Thanks be to God, let's pray. God, heal the nations, heal our hurts. We want to say, I want to say, save us from pain and suffering. And yet we know that Jesus himself said, blessed are those who are persecuted. Help us to understand and more than understand to trust you in all of this. Give us courage and resolve when we are going through or experiencing various forms of pain and suffering. We do not run to those, but in the midst of them, give us the grace to walk that road, those roads. We thank you that you've gone before us in pain and suffering, that you know what it is to be brokenhearted and you are full of compassion and and will forever be. We thank you that you took our death on the cross, our penalty, our crucifixion, so that we didn't have to. We thank you and praise you that as we sung earlier, you are raised from the dead and in your resurrection we have hope not only for ourselves but for the world being redeemed one day fully. In the name of Jesus, amen.